Okay, wonderful. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I know more people are going to be joining us. Um, I'm Sam Carpenter. I'm executive director with the Hoosier Environmental Council, and I want to welcome you, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join us here today. Um, I want to thank you for caring enough to show up uh, to learn more about how you can be an effective advocate uh, for issues that you care most about. Um, so uh, why are we here today? Uh, Hoosier Environmental Council uh, believes strongly um, we work for strong environmental policy and practices in the state of Indiana and improve quality of life for all Hoosiers. And we see those things as very interconnected. Um, we at HEC believe that individual advocacy can be impactful and have an influence on individual policy. Uh, we know personal experience of lawmakers and shared experience through stories by their constituents can have a powerful impact on their decision-making. Now, our Indiana lawmakers might face uh, well over a thousand bills in a session. Um, a lot to, to keep up with, uh, can't be an expert on everything. Uh, so hearing from constituents can make an issue stand out. Um, what we wanna do is help uh, you find uh, ways to build uh, momentum around your advocacy. So one voice, your voice is a start. Of course, it takes, uh, if others take up that call as well, your voice is multiplied. Um, as um, And as it multiplies, it gains power and influence. And of course, having a clear and understandable message um, uh, that you can bring um, helps as well. So we're going to talk about messaging around two of the priorities that HEC has for the upcoming legislative session. Uh, but I, enough for me. Um, I We have some special guests with us here today. Uh, and people who have special insights um, as elected officials um, and also an individual advocate. Um, so before I do those um, introductions, I want to give you a couple logistics. Um, we are recording today, um, so the session will be made available as a recording and a follow-up email to you. Um, we also will have a question and answer near the end of the session. If you look um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A um, box and you can click on that and put questions into the Q&A. We'll do our best to answer your question, uh, but we've already actually received a number of great questions and we'll do our best to highlight some of those as well. We'll send up uh, further answers to the Q&A in the follow-up email, because I know we won't probably get to be able to answer all of them. Um, so those uh, and additional you know, resources will be made available uh, after the fact. Um, we're excited. We're at 111 people now joining us. Um, so that's exciting that we've got such a great uh, turnout. Uh, another thing that I want to highlight to you is that we have uh, a survey that we're going to put uh, into the chat um, that we'll ask you to complete uh, before you before you leave with us today. Um, you can do that toward the end. Um, it's not something you need to be online with us to complete. It'll take you to a, a survey, but that really helps us be better in the things that we do. Um, okay, we're going to get started. Um, our speakers today, uh, Senator Ron Alting, uh, representative Indiana, representing Indiana State uh, Senate District 22, which is Carroll County and portions of Tippecanoe County, is here with us today. Uh, representative Sue Arrington, uh, House District 34, representing uh, Muncie and Delaware County, uh, is with us today. Uh, one thing that I like to say is both Senator Alting and Representative Arrington have, have served multiple terms in state government. Uh, both bring a great deal of experience with the General Assembly and in working with constituents, and both are extremely busy people. Um, so we at Hoosier Environmental Council are pleased, so pleased that they can join us today and take that time 
um, and so that you can hear directly from them on this topic. Uh, Mary Blackburn uh, is a retired nurse practitioner and a nurse midwife um, who cares about Hoosier uh, health and the environment. Uh, she's been a supportive of HEC for years and uh, also serves as the creation care advocate of the NF Friends Committee on Legislation, which is a nonprofit Quaker advocacy organization. Uh, Delaney Barber is with us today. Um, she's our energy and outreach coordinator, and she'll be sharing later about one of HEC's legislative priorities, um, which is community solar. Um, and Indra Frank is with us. She's an environmental health and water policy director, um, and she'll be sharing uh, later about uh, our legislative priority around wetland protection. Um, and Emily uh, Plunkett is with us today, and she's also providing some kind of behind the scenes uh, background support for us. Um, so we wanna thank you all, our speakers for being here and Senator Alting and Representative Arrington, if you wanna go ahead and turn on your cameras at this point, we'll get started with our conversation. Excellent. Well, thank you again, both for joining us today. And I wonder if you could just tell a little bit we might have some uh, guests with us today that are attending that maybe haven't sat down with one of their elected officials before. Um, do, uh, could one of you uh, maybe uh, represent uh, uh, Arrington start out just what should someone expect as they um, just kind of briefly, what should someone expect if they when they get ready to have a meeting? Well, um... I like to have an open door. I like to meet with my constituents. And so um, they should expect someone who's going to pay attention and listen to what they have to say. Um, sometimes it's a personal visit. Sometimes if somebody stops me in the grocery store. When I go shopping, I usually plan about 15 minutes longer than I used to before I was a legislator. Um, I know sometimes people are very reluctant. They feel like, oh, they're impinging on our privacy or our time. But we are public officials. And I think it's very important to be uh, open to knowing what our constituents uh, think is important. And uh, sometimes, as I say, it's in person. Um, other times, um, you know, somebody, a phone call, either at home or at the office. Um, email is one of my favorite ways of communicating with um, constituents. Even actually, I like that better than letters because the letters may be in a pile on my desk, but I can organize the emails better <laughs> than the letters. Although if you're a letter writer, you don't do uh, electronic um letters are fine uh, great <laughs> wonderful thank you thank you for that and and senator alting uh, how important do you think this type of engagement is and i guess if you have anything to add on to uh what uh, representative errington said and let's see i'm gonna ask you to unmute here Great, thank you. It's, it's very important because you've got 150 legislators and, and we're all a little different in different ways and we have our own different policies. I have an open door policy. My staff is trained that if a truck driver comes down and wants to see me, he or she is treated the same way as the CEO of Caterpillar or Alcoa uh, or Subaru Automotive. So we treat every everybody the same. Uh, uh, certain senators uh, are more accessible than others. Some you may never get in front of. You have to communicate by emails. Uh, and Representative Erickson is correct. Usually the, the best form of communication is email. I also will reiterate that it's also important, if you can, to focus in on whoever you're wanting to meet with is make sure that that it helps if you can contact someone in that district. It means a lot versus getting group emails 
that everyone gets the same email. You can see when you read it that it's a group email. You want to personalize email when you do that. But more importantly, if if you're wanting to see Senator Alting, I'm open to everybody, and there's a reason why the name state is before Senator. I believe that you represent also the entire state. Not everybody believes that. So it never hurts to try to focus in on people in those districts that uh, uh, that they can vote for that particular senator. It, it makes a difference to certain people. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And what do you think, if someone comes in and sits down with you, uh, what's what's impactful? What helps shape your opinion? Is it is it personal stories? Is it lots of uh, information like facts and figures? Is it the argument they present? Like what what makes a difference to you? A little bit of both. However, compassion and speaking from the heart and having a personal reason behind something to me always means more uh, to be brief because the, all legislators' times are extremely valuable. So to be brief, get to the point. Uh, but I think speak from the heart. And on, on uh, and it never hurts to have two or three with you. While you're, it, that way you can have a couple different people uh, uh, say what's on their minds or advocate for whatever the reason is that they're here for. But uh, I think speaking from the heart always gains you more ground. We get bombarded with statistics and and all that. Uh, so I I wouldn't say don't dominate your conversation with that, but more so compassion and from the heart. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I, I would agree um, with what Senator Alting has said. Uh, I think it's very important that that someone has come to visit with you at the state house in some ways for someone who hasn't done it before it's rather intimidating and coming with a couple other people helps you feel more comfortable um those personal stories do carry a lot of weight especially when it's someone that is you know from your your district so that lived experience really can make a, a quite an impact. I know, um, especially on on controversial issues. I can remember um, a woman contacted me, uh, actually she was a member of my church, about her uh, daughter who was transgender and this was in the discussion of bans on medical treatment for transgender youth. And she told her story. It was so compelling that I asked her to write it down. And I ended up um, giving part of it in a floor speech on on the House floor when we were doing um, the final reading on the bill. Uh, logical arguments are good. Um, I think most of us do think we need to be be logical. And to be truthful is the other thing that's really important. Um, I've seen, though, on some of these controversial issues that emotion tends to trump logic, which is really sad to think that that's the case, but sometimes it is. Um, bringing a group, uh, I think, is good. I think of the Farm Bureau. I don't know if they do this all over the state, but the Farm Bureau in my area gets farmers from the district to come down, I think it's like once a month, and they invite all the legislators and you know that they that are their legislators to lunch, and we go over and talk with them, and they tell us their priorities, and um, they ask us, "What do you think about this?" So it's a it's a you know a pleasant thing, uh, but it's also they find out where you stand. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, Senator Altin, what do you what do you say to people that think that they can't make a difference? Um, maybe they don't think it's worth reaching out because they're not going to to move anything. Do you have any words uh, words for them? You know, it's your government. We work for you. We just occupy a seat. That's all we do. 
And I, I, I've been here 26 years. I'm number one in seniority in the Senate. And let me tell you something. It's still the people's, it's still the people's government. And there's frustrations. And sometimes uh, it takes a while to get something done. It's a slow process, particularly in the area of environmental affairs. You're not going to change the world in, in one year or two years or maybe even three you got to keep chipping at it and going back and being persistent and persistent. So, oh, absolutely. I mean, we work for you. And uh, I think that's that's very, very important. Uh, uh, I, and I really believe that for a majority of legislators, they still get that, you know. So uh, don't get frustrated, but also be realistic and and make sure you understand that sometimes – you don't get everything you want the first go around or the second go around, but uh, you just got to chip away at it. So it's a long, slow process, but you have a tremendous impact on on the future of the entity that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. The other thing to remember is uh, if you're not speaking up, there's probably someone who disagrees with you who is. Yep. So the legislators only hearing from one side of an issue uh, that could, you know, care, um, convince them that, you know, nobody cares about the the environment the way you do. So you know, let me just add on to that, that again, I'm reiterating this. It's important that if you're contacting your house member or your senator in your district that you open up that email by telling them that you are a constituent of yours. Yes. It's very important that you do that because I, I know Representative uh, Arrington and myself, we get hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands on certain subject matters of emails. And when you see that it's somebody in your district, it's just common sense that you're gonna read that a little bit more careful because that, that is your district that you take extra pride for. So remember to do that. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I think that's a good point is that uh, sometimes what the, the, the goal that we're having is just to have a voice heard uh, initially um, and, and to realize that change uh, happens over time and with a lot of, uh, a lot of a lot of work so it's good to have that reminder that you know initially uh a, a goal is to to have your voice be be heard um senator alting i wonder if you could tell me have, have there any stories that's or kind of times that stand out in your mind where an individual has had a, a big impact on uh you know on you or on uh legislation that uh, you've been involved with oh my goodness yeah i mean all, all types. Uh, I mean, let's talk about uh, uh, drug driving. Uh, you know, I've been here long enough that there was an, it, and again, there's a good example. It took 15 to 20 years to get it to 0.08 to, to be uh, uh, legally uh, driving drunk. And, and it was before that, that we had a, a young girl uh, that was driving with her boyfriend in high school in her car and her dad and mom was in the car ahead of them. And long story short, they, the mom and dad looked into the rearview mirror and seen a drunk driver swerve over and hit their daughter's car and killed her. And, you know, that was a moving uh, story to me that it didn't take long for me to vote for 0.08. I'll also tell you, uh, you know, I'm chairman of the public policy committee, and as a chairman, I heard a house bill that came over, and to show you the power of, of just the ordinary people, it was four women, uh, and one of them had lost her, uh, I'll be real brief on this, but lost her high school daughter in between volleyball games, who went to a, co a teammate's house and got on the four-wheelers at the farm and was driving and flipped and killed her and it was that that voted uh, a bill into law saying that uh, you got to wear a helmet on a four-wheeler with the exception of agriculture and some other 
reasons, but, um, you know, those, and again, that bill was done by four women. It wasn't to suit people in the lobbyists and the high rise buildings. That was done from the boots on the ground by just the ordinary citizen. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's why I was saying compassion and speak from the heart. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Representative Arrington, um, if you want to add on to that, you can. But I'm also wondering if you have any uh, tips for, for people, how they can really maximize their impact when meeting with their elected officials. Well, I, I do have a story that is sort of along the lines of what you're asking. Um, this was back in the day when um, Indiana General Assembly was considering amending the Constitution to make marriage only between a man and a woman. So it was an anti-gay marriage amendment. And in Indiana, a constitutional amendment has to be voted on twice by the legislature, same language, with an election in between before it can go out to the public for a vote. So the, the resolution had made it through to the second um, vote of the General Assembly. But during that time, the proponents of, well, the, the opponents of this ban uh, got active and they did a lot of going, you know, door to door, finding people that agreed with them and asking them to talk with their legislators right there in their own districts. And the story I'm getting to is that um, um, Representative Kevin Mahan from Hartford City, who's no longer in the legislature, but he um, told a story at the local third house meeting that the Chamber of Commerce puts on. Um, he had always voted for that amendment, but he said he was having second thoughts because of the people in his district that were contacting him. And he said that he got a knock on the door one evening and when he opened it, it was his next door neighbor who had mm -hmm. never expressed any opinions on you know, legislative issues, but this man, I guess had been, maybe there was someone in his family that it would affect. And he came over and talked right there on his, his doorstep with Representative Mahan. So it, it can make a difference. Right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Representative Arrington, I'll come back to you and ask, are there any things that people should avoid doing? Maybe it's, they think that this is gonna have an impact, but uh, maybe it, it doesn't go the way they planned. <laughs> well, I can tell you, we don't appreciate being yelled at or threats, even if they're sort of veiled threats. Uh, we like for people to, you know, be civil. Mm -hmm. And so I think being civil is, and you don't have to like the person, <laughs> But just respect their position and um, and be, as a, I think, you know, logical, reasonable when you talk with them. Be polite uh, because nobody likes to be yelled at. And maybe as an advocate, you know this person is not going to vote your way. You may feel like <laughs> yelling at them, but it's it's better to try to keep it on a, a civil note. And, you know, it's always good to thank the person for meeting with you, the legislator for meeting you, maybe, you know, just in person when you say goodbye, or you might want to write a thank you note uh, saying that you were glad they, they took the time to meet with you. Great. Senator Alting, would you add anything to that? Is there anything? Uh, she answered that absolutely perfect. I don't know if you can... <laughs> add any more to that i may just say this because i've seen this not happen and that is you know, particularly if it's a chairman that's in charge of a bill that you're advocating on whatever that chairman tells you like it or not you should probably respect and not trying to go around that chairman 
and and use a baseball bat approach when trying to get your bill heard uh, or or something in that nature. And now that doesn't mean you can't have somebody contact that chairman that you may know or another legislator and see if they can convince that chairman and to hearing the bill. And I'm just giving that as an example. But there's been a lot of times that I've seen their cases have been hurt more by not listening to a chairman and going around the chairman. And then uh, things have happened, even an article in the paper, bad mouth in the chairman for not hearing the bill or something uh, like that. And, you know, the chairman has a lot of power. It's simple as that. They can, in Indiana, the chairman is the one that makes a decision on whether a bill is heard or not. It's not usually the speaker and it's not usually the pro tem. It can be, but statistically it's the chairman. So in Indiana, chairman has an incredible amount of power. So always use the honey approach like Representative <laughs> Arrington was saying and be polite, absolutely no threats. Uh, and and uh, you'll get a lot more done that way. Great, thank you. And and so a question for you about that for the chairman: um, is it a, is the same rule apply to hearing from uh, constituents, or since the chairman's dealing more broadly, um, do you should uh, individuals reach out to the chairman even if you're not a constituent? No, they, they're, they're welcome to, to reach out to a chairman mm -hmm. because it's so important. That chairman is the one that's going to make a decision. So if you're advocating on a bill that's in the House or the Senate and it's going to a certain, it's assigned to a certain uh, committee, uh, no, I would say that. And, and, and to do your research and not only find out who the chairman is, but members of the committee. And you also are respectful in sending emails or trying to meet with members of the committee and mm -hmm. doing it in a ladylike and gentleman-like uh, fashion. So it doesn't look like you're going to go around a chairman, but you're just using consensus to try to get your bill heard. And if it is being heard, then you're then you're reason to contact those people on the committee is totally different. And that is, hey, I need your vote. <laughs> I need a yes vote from you, right? Or if it's a bill you hate, it's, hey, I need a no vote from you. You know, it goes both ways. Um, you know, another person that I know some people contact is their own legislator. Um, probably one who would have uh, be of the same party as a chairperson. And if they support what you want, you might ask them to speak with the chairperson about why they think it would be a, an, a good public policy decision. Mm -hmm. Right, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. This is super helpful um, and insightful. Um, I, we're going to kind of uh, move on to the next part of our uh, discussion, but I wonder if you, uh, uh, Senator Dalton, do you want to make any sort of a final statement? And then I'll invite you, uh, Representative Arrington. No, I just thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to be here. And uh, I think being a good leader is being a good listener. So I look forward to the next part of this uh, this program. Great, thank you. I guess my only thing is um, uh, when I was an advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment, I attended a rally that Senator Louis Mayhern from Indianapolis uh, spoke at. And he told us that sometimes it's easier to change legislators than to change a legislator's vote. That really struck a you know a bell with me and a lot of other people. Uh, so, but I think it it shows the importance of who is actually in those seats. And one of the best times that you can have to make a difference is during the election process. Number one, to vote. Number two, if there's a candidate that you that has the same uh, position as you do, you may want to help that candidate get elected by volunteering for the campaign. So, uh, and I must say that during an election, all candidates are out there wanting to meet the public. 
and they're more receptive to having public meetings then where they can talk about their their platform but it's also an option or opportunity for people to ask some questions about their position on on various issues that are important to you great thank you thank you very much for that um, and yes, thank you, uh, Representative Arrington and Senator Alting, who's just stepped away for a minute. Um, Mary, can I ask you to uh, turn on your uh, camera and join here? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, Mary, you've heard a lot of uh, good discussion here. Um, tell me a little bit, like, um, briefly, I guess, what makes you be engaged on, on these issues? What drives you to uh, take these steps? Well, first of all, I want to thank both Representative Arrington and uh, Senator Alting. Everything they said rings so true with what I've experienced. And part of the reason I get involved is because if, just like both of them said, if they constituents don't speak up, they're not going to know that there are people that care deeply about some of these issues. So, and for me to be a volunteer um, uh, citizen, who, who I'm naturally shy. And so to work up the courage to make that phone call or make that arrangement for a meeting takes a lot of um, personal energy to be willing to do that. And, um, and also finding a way to put your thoughts together, in, just as they have suggested, that's clear and logical, but with a personal story of why you care. Great. Well, um, tell us a little bit about your experience Have um, in, in meeting with the legislator and, um, and kind of what kind of things that you would relay to our our webinar participants. It looks like we're up to about uh, 124 now. That's exciting. Um, tell us a little bit about your um, experience and what you would suggest or kind of share with them. Well, one thing I'd like to remind people is that they are public servants, but they also are not full-time legislators. Many of our um, legislators are also have businesses to run and other occupations. So their time can be very limited and very valuable. So um, one of the things I wanted to suggest is just like um, Senator um, Representative Arrington mentioned, people reach out to her in the grocery store. So be aware of opportunities where your representative uh, is uh, at a farmer's market or having a town hall um, or meeting at a, a neighborhood association. Invite your legislator to come and share their, their vision. Um, during the uh, during the legislative sessions, they are so very busy. As you pointed out, over a thousand bills come through, and um, and especially in the minority party, they are um, having to meet in so many different sessions. They have multiple responsibilities, and it's hard for them to stay on ta uh, on track of all the things that are happening. So sometimes your phone call or your reminder may let them know about something that they've just been very busy uh, and can't pay attention to at the moment. And so the other thing I just, uh, I've learned that um, during the sessions, you wanna stay in touch with their legislative assistant. And some, again, in the minority party, some of those legislative assistants are helping three or four legislators. And that's a lot to keep track of as well. So um, always be polite, be kind. They are human beings and they have things that are very important to them. So um, I think for us to remember that um, is so important in all of your dealings with everyone that you meet. Um, one other thing I know uh, you're going to go on to some really important um, things, but I do want to highlight that when uh, HEC or other allies um, around environment and energy are having a special lobby day, that is a great time to take a friend and go meet with your legislator. There are a lot of them are expecting that during those days. So that's a great time to go get your, your ideas put together, make it concise, 
and have that time with your legislator. And if we have time, Sam, I'll just share a real brief story about a good friend of mine who came, who, who came to um, the Energy Day, brought his neighbor who has solar panels. And so they went to meet with their legislator, um, that's um, Representative Becky Cash in, in Zionsville. And they talked about why they supported that, why they thought it was important for Hoosiers, why they thought it was important for the environment and that they personally have invested in it. And they invited her and her husband to come and see the solar panels. Well, it was a busy session. And at end of session, um, Representative Cash came to his home and learned all about uh, this, this um, system. And uh, so that was a, a great success in that she accepted the invitation. Her husband's an engineer and found it quite fascinating. And also perhaps a part of that conversation when the, the um, bill for a climate study bill came forward, um, she, she voted yes. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Mary, for um, sharing your perspective and for being an advocate um, and putting yourself out there uh, to make your voice heard. Um, let's see, Emily, I'm going to, we're going to move on. Emily, I'm going to ask if you can put up the slide about um, kind of reaching out. Okay, wonderful. So just some of the very basics of how do I schedule a meeting uh, with my legislator? We're going to share this, but um, realize that it does, it can take a little bit of time um, and probably um, one of the things that one of, the, but also one of the most effective things you can do uh, to advocate for your cause. Um, first, you uh, there's resources to identify your uh, representative, your legislators, um, and we'll provide. There's a link here um, that we'll provide for you, um, and you want to find out, um, you know, their contact information. Uh, all the legislators have a legislative assistant that manages the scheduling. Um, so you can call that person, you can, um, whether in session or out of session, you can send them an email and um, they will work with you to set up the meeting. Um, now, if um, it, it might take a little back and forth to get that meeting set up with, you know, schedules and that sort of thing. So you can expect that it might go back and forth a little bit, but uh, that's an opportunity for you, a way for you to set up your meeting. Um, again, the January through March or April, depending on the length of the session, is when they're in session and might have a harder time, um, you know, scheduling something. Uh, in the summer, there are awesome, also often study committees, which can be an opportunity to have your voice heard as well. Those are uh, usually listed um, and many of those are available to uh, open uh, comment and uh, you know being there present for those. Um, and then also um, there's, let's see, there's the option of Zoom or in person. Um, a lot of times we uh, at HCC will have a, a Zoom meeting rather than the in-person. Um, you know, in-person is always nice, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and then just, you know, as you've heard, come prepared, uh, focus on what's most important to you, share uh, how it, the issues impact you personally. Come from uh, where you are as an individual, um, and, and people that you know and share those stories. And as Senator Alton, I think, said so well, speak from the heart. Um, and ask them, how do they feel about the issue? Uh, get that get that feedback from them um, and offer to provide follow-up information. Uh, if, if you have that, if you think there's something relevant, important that you can provide for them later on. And we want to invite you to uh, reach out to Hoosier Environmental Council for, for help and assistance. Um, I think uh, Representative Arrington gave it a great example of the Farm Bureau coming together to, to meet and Hoosier Environmental Council can be a resource for you for that as well. And we'd love to hear from you. If you have those meetings, uh, reach out to us and let us know uh, how those go. Um, okay, we're going to keep moving. 
Um, and Emily, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and drop that survey in the chat. Um, and folks don't need to fill it out now, but I want you to know it's in there. And now I'm going to invite uh, Delaney to come and talk about one of our so what we're going to do now is we're going to hear about a couple of uh, HEC's priorities, and then we're going to go to the Q&A. So Delaney, can you uh, join us for the uh, community solar portion? Yes. Okay, so I only have a few minutes to talk about um, an important topic to HEC, which is community solar. Um, next slide, Emily. But first, I'll give a brief definition of what is community solar. So independent community solar allows third-party developers to invest in and install small solar panel systems on warehouses, rooftops, libraries, um, houses of worship, old industrial sites, which are often called brownfields, um, and more within a community. And then renters, homeowners, schools, or businesses can purchase a solar subscription and then receive an energy credit on their bills, so those energy savings. This is creating and using energy all in the same place. And what's unique about independent community solar is it helps Hoosiers attract tens of millions of dollars in investment to the state. It can lower utility bills and increase energy reliability and community resilience. This takes out kind of the upfront costs of solar panels and the limitations of rooftop solar panels um, to create equitable solar access. However, third party community solar lacks legislative approval, which is where you all come in. So next slide. Now your story. And this is where it's time to have a conversation with your legislator. Um, Representative Arrington and Senator Alting also shared this. You wanna be concise, but this is your time to relate whatever solution or topic you um, feel most strongly about and relate it to your life. And community solar is really relatable because everybody has a utility bill Everyone understands the fluctuation in utility costs and the frustration that comes with only having one option. And when you're telling your story, you want to start with the problem, the challenges you face and the impacts you feel. And this could be the rising cost of living, the barriers because you're a renter or just the costs or barriers with rooftop solar if you're a homeowner, even how air pollution might impact you because when you have community solar, it's in your community. So without those emissions and pollution, it's using less of natural gas and coal plants that might be nearby your community. Um, these are all ways to kind of share your story and share those challenges. And then you can get to, there are no other options. And I believe that community solar can be that option for me. And this is where you can start talking about why community solar is a good solution. And next slide. These are some community solar talking points about why this can be a good policy for everyday Hoosiers. First, it lowers utility bills. So community solar subscribers get that energy credit on their bill based on how much energy their portion of the solar panels produce. It fosters community and economic development. So not only does it bring in federal funding that would be lost if we don't have independent community solar um, and put it to good use in Indiana. And it also helps with community tax base. It fosters community with neighbors because it creates this new connection with our cities. You could have community solar on the school down the street and you know that you're supporting that and some supporting your community. Um, it also equals equitable solar. So clean energy independence has long been out of reach for many Hoosiers due to costs and requirements of rooftop solar, especially after net metering has ended. And community solar does not require that large upfront investment or maintenance. It's just a subscription. 
It also provides domestic clean energy. So limiting those impacts we feel on the international energy markets of oil and natural gas fluctuations because solar stays the same. Um, it creates jobs. So the Department of Energy recently released its uh, U.S. Energy Employment Report. And over the last year, Indiana alone saw more than a 3% growth in clean energy jobs. And nationally, we saw a 4% growth. And this is expected to keep growing. A um, couple other talking points you could discuss. It's increasing community resiliency and reliability. It adds this capacity to our grid during surges and outages. It limits any line loss that happens during transmission because you're using the energy where you're creating the energy. And it even lowers energy costs during normal demand because there's more energy on the grid. And it works in 22 other states already. And they have introduced this policy in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio. So we're hoping it successfully passes the finish line there, but it's worked and states have expanded. So um, if you need any other information on these talking points, please reach out to me because it's a lot of information and this will also be recorded so you can come back to it. Great, thank you, Delaney. And as Delaney said, start with your personal impact, your story, how it impacts you. And then there is information that we have available. And you can even leave that information behind with your representative or follow up with it um, as, your, as there is quite a bit. Okay, I'm gonna invite now Indra. Indra's gonna share briefly about our wetlands uh, protection uh, legislative priority. Thanks, Sam. My name is Indra and I work on water issues for the Hoosier Environmental Council. As you're reaching out to your elected officials, we hope you'll consider raising the issue of wetlands. The wetlands issue is particularly important right now uh, because just a few months ago, the Supreme Court issued a decision that the fate of wetlands is basically up to the states. Under Indiana's current wetland law, uh, only about 25% of our wetlands are, are uh, protected. And if I could add the next slide, Losing wetlands means loss of wildlife habitat, loss of groundwater recharge, and increased flooding. Flooding is the most dramatic consequence of losing wetlands, but it might not be self-evident how wetland loss and flooding are linked. So I have diagrams here to help us with that concept. Um, in this slide, we see a landscape with a stream and some wetlands that are holding onto water. Wetlands provide um, key water storage. Uh, they can store up to 1.5 million gallons of water per acre. So when the wetlands are lost, and here we'll go to the next slide, as we see in this next schematic, if those wetlands are lost, then the 1.5 million gallons per acre that they were holding has to go somewhere else. And that means more water for the people downstream to deal with. Let's go to the next slide. When you meet with your elected officials, I hope you'll consider raising the importance of wetlands. Um, and these are some talking points that, that you might bring with you. First, that the Supreme Court has left the fate of wetlands up to the states, that Indiana's wetlands provide critical wildlife habitat, groundwater recharge, and flood protection. Indiana needs better wetland preservation and restoration. And if you can, bring local examples with you um, as we've heard from Senator Alting and Representative Arrington, when you can speak from the heart and, and talk about issues that are within uh, the, your legislator's district, um, that, that helps make a difference. So thank you. Thanks so much, Indra. Thanks for that. And we just wanted to briefly highlight a couple of priorities. And if you're on our email list and that sort of thing, then you'll get a lot more information about that and we'll provide some follow-up. We're going to go to our Q&A section. I'll invite all of our panelists to uh, turn your uh, cameras back on. Um, we um, and if you go if you haven't already, uh, go ahead and put your question into the Q&A. And while those are kind of coming in, I'm just going to say. Um, say so we have a lot of supporters here with us today. If you're new to HEC or would think about 
uh, supporting us with a financial contribution. If you uh, support the work we're doing, you find this valuable, uh, we're going to drop a uh, link to our donation page uh, in the chat as well. Um, so you can see that there if that's something that you would like to do and, and join us in that way. Um, again, the survey is in the chat and um, that's an opportunity for you to give your feedback on how things did and, and help us um, be better here. Um, and so a couple of questions that we've got, um, which is best, a visit at the state house or in the home district? Uh, Representative Arrington, do you wanna um, uh, take that one? And, and uh, Senator Alton, if you're able, if you can start your video up, then we'll bring some of these to you as well. You know, I don't know that one location is more important than the other. Uh, to the legislator, uh, I meet with people. In fact, I met with someone a couple of days ago at a local coffee house because he had an issue he wanted me to, he wanted to talk with me about. Um, I guess really it's what's convenient for you, uh, going to the state house or or arranging a, me a meeting at home. And it's usually um, the legislative assistant for the legislator who sets helps set up those meetings because they have access to our calendars. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a, a comment here about uh, Bloomington considering a banning plastic bags during 2016 General Assembly. Uh, Ronald Bacon, Republican, uh, retired, introduced House Bill 1053. It was co-authored by Jim Lucas. It was uh, concurred upon by the Senate. The past bill on partisan lines, uh, Governor Pence signed it um, in 2016. Information provided by uh, Gabrielle Donnelly, legislative assistant, uh, Ed Delaney. Um, how best to change this bill? And I think um, what we find at the Hoosier Environmental Council is working within coalitions um, to have an impact. And this is a uh, bill that was... Um, an issue we have partners with, you know, within the state that we're working with on this. And uh, as, as we said before, uh, change doesn't always happen quickly, but it's good to keep uh, these types of issues out, out in front. Um, we have another question here about how important uh, to legislative decision-making are the near-term economics impacts of a particular bill. So the in economic impact, how, how much does that influence decision-making? I don't know, uh, Senator Jolte, is that something that you wanna take on or uh, or, or either one? Oh, let's see, you're currently muted. Yeah, it, that's a great, great question. And, and my answer is gonna even confuse you more. Okay. <laughs> you, would, you would think it does, but I can tell you, and there's so many issues particularly on health care related issues, that if you invest the small amount of money up front to solve a health care issue, you know, what's being diagnosed or what have you, it saves X amount of dollars down the line. Mental health is a great example of that. You know, that if you, if you invest, all the statistics are there on the economic development end of it, that the, the better... You, you approach mental health and, and you know, provide the services that it helps them being, for instance, incarcerated at close to $40,000 a year. But we can't look how long it took us to do anything in mental health. And, and we know what our challenges are in health care and alcoholism and drug abuse and, and all that. I mean, so I'd like to tell you that, yes, you would think that it, it would matter. And under certain conditions, it does. I mean, there's no question about it. But then in other subject matters, it, they just turn their heads. Uh, so I know it's not a very good answer, but I would tell you what, it's a truthful answer. <laughs> great, I think great. we just saw an example of how waiting until things were basically crisis 
proportion to take action. And that's with the public health bill that we finally passed, even not as, even though it wasn't as strong as what the public health task force that the governor had um, had uh, established or what the governor wanted, but at least it's beginning to address public health at the local level and putting some money behind the effort. Great, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Emily, I'm gonna ask you, uh, put the survey uh, into the chat again and, uh, and ask, invite everybody to click on that link and you can complete the survey um, even after the webinar. Um, we got a question ahead of time. Um, let's see. Uh, I've, uh, I agree entirely with my legislator. Should I contact them? Um, <laughs> Do I yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yes uh we like to i mean we're hearing from people who disagree <laughs> so it's important to to know that there are others who do agree on a position and it's also important because um, you know a lot of times legislators are looking at at their mail and if they only hear from one side they i mean they know that Yes, they're going to vote that way, but it feels good to know that there are other people that are supporting you for doing that. Great, thank you. He's absolutely right. I mean, what would you say, Sue? Probably <laughs> 95, 98% of our constituent work is those people that's in opposition to a bill, you know, or trying to sell us on a bill, but you don't get too many pats on the back uh, in this, this type of uh, self servant which is okay. But I would tell you, when I'm at the grocery store, I always tell people I live in my community. I go to the dry cleaners. I do my own grocery shopping. I go to the basketball games in high school. Uh, it's always nice for someone that I don't even know to come up to me and pat me on the back and say, thank you. I agree with you on so many of your, your, your uh, votes. Not all of them, but yeah. a lot of them. <laughs> but it really uh, it makes your day. Yes, it does. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a question. I'm going to put this one to Mary. Um, what is your most important part about being a change maker? Uh, sometimes being a change maker can be overwhelming. Do you have any any tips for getting started and keeping motivation up? Well, sometimes it can be very discouraging because you may think, well, I'm taking action. They should listen. And um, so it's kind of reassuring to hear what Doc, uh, Senator Alting has to say and uh, Representative Arrington. But I would say get some like-minded people around you that will help you and work together, find allies so you can keep your energy up and say, well, this does make a difference. And like this webinar today is very encouraging to me. And it's helping me to know I should continue to raise my voice. And so I really appreciate that you've offered this today. Great. Thank you. I think that's right. And I would add, you know, celebrate the small victories. Uh, even though you haven't reached your ultimate goal, um, progress and just moving things forward is progress. Um, and it's important uh, to start. Um, have those, those, those uh, early goals of just getting started. And I think that will be helpful. Um, let's see. Some of these, I'm looking at a lot of the questions. I was more coming in that we had received before. Uh, there's a question about House Bill 1512. And I think that we probably need to do some research on that one to get back to you. Um, Let's see, are there certain lawmakers identified at this time who are willing to carry a water or community solar bill? Um, that is something that uh, Hoosier Environmental Council is working with coalition partners on very closely with to find those legislators that will uh, carry a bill. And what and what we what we know is if we have a champion um, that will uh, uh, you know, speak uh, forcefully on behalf of something that that's going to make an a real impact. So on those issues of like wetlands and community solar, 
the more I think uh, your state uh, legislators hear about the importance of those issues, the more likely we are to find you know, that champion and that broader support to get something through. So thanks for that question. Um, let's see. How to get a response from my house member. Um, <laughs> and uh, phone calls and emails. Uh, let's see. I think, you know, um, is there, I see somebody, uh, Mary is typing an answer there. Um, I think, you know, one thing that I would say is if you're not getting a response is to uh, do that contact in the community um, and see if there's ways at a public event or something like that that you can reach out. I don't know, uh, Representative Arrington or Senator Alton, you both have talked about your open door policy. Uh, do you have any suggestions for us to, to uh, elected officials that don't have that open door policy? Um. Well, we have staff that can help us respond to communication from constituents. And so if somebody's not, um, they must not be using all the resources that they have at their, their hands. So uh, I guess, as you said, reaching out to them in the community is maybe the next best step. Or giving a phone call. At, at the Senate office and talking to the L.A. You're, the, a legislator's L.A. is like a wife. I mean, <laughs> you can't function without an L.A. And you just pray like a wife that you got a good one. Because <laughs> yeah, right. they can make you or break you. <laughs> so, you know, call. And, and they will answer the phone usually and introduce themselves. I'm the legislative assistant for Senator Alting, and how can I help you? So, you know, I've been sending some emails and whatnot, and I'm not hearing back. Is there anything I'm doing wrong? Or, And and I also will say, they are, I'm not making excuses. There are legislators, for whatever reason, they don't answer back. And I, I can't give you an explanation why, but I also would tell you, there's been times I've had people stop me and say, I didn't hear from you. And it's just because the system, we have dropped the ball somewhere along the system. So if you've tried it only once and you didn't hear, try again sending it and maybe even a third time to make sure that out of the hundreds and sometimes thousands of communications a House member or Senator gets, it didn't fall through the cracks. And I might add that you don't need to know the LA's name or their phone number because if you just call the legislators number that person will will probably answer it yeah great well we've reached our time today um and i feel like we've covered a lot of great information information again our panelists uh, uh representative errington uh senator altstein uh and mary as well as our he staff I want to thank you so much for taking your time and sharing with us today. I think this was really helpful. I want to thank all the folks that participated today and joining us. Um, and I hope that you found it helpful. And we hope that we'll hear uh, your feedback through the survey. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it up so everybody can get on to their uh, busy lives. I hope you have a wonderful uh, Labor Day weekend. And uh, I think we'll we'll leave it there. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>